Well, if you haven't already done so, then would you turn back to Ruth chapter 2? And as you turn back there, I want to ask a question. Have you ever been picking before? No, I don't mean picking clothes at Kmart or a pair of R.M. William boots. I mean, have you ever been at the edge of a field in those wee hours of the morning and you see that field ripe for harvest? Maybe pumpkin or watermelon or something else. And you think of the labor that's about to go into that. Maybe you think of that and it makes your back hurt just thinking about it. Being bent over all day, hard at labor. But as we open up this passage in Ruth, that's what we find before us. As we read before, now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. This is the start of the harvest season. It is a wonderful, hopeful time, a time of great rejoicing. And so as we would come to this passage, I want to open it up as we look at these three characters, Ruth and her initiative in going out towards these fields, Boaz and the generosity that he shows towards Ruth. And lastly, we'll look at Naomi's response to the harvest that comes in and so as we come back we think about these characters and their situation and where they've come from we think about Ruth who is she where does she come from well as Naomi and Ruth enter into this scene we've seen previously how they've been widowed in a far country they go away and they lose their husbands well Naomi in particular but then Ruth comes back without her husband as well They're poor, they're vulnerable. In Ruth's case, she's a stranger, likely facing that aspect of poverty as they lose the men who would sustain them in Israel. And so that's where we find them as we come up into this passage. And so let us simply read through these verses in chapter 2. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz, and we'll come back to him. So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose, eye, in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz who was of the family of Elimelech. When we think of Ruth's situation and what we're reading here, she asks of her mother-in-law, please let me go to the field and glean heads. When you think of gleaning, I wonder what comes to mind. Gleaning is that practice. If you know somebody who uh, has harvest pumpkins or these sort of things, then you'd know that you go through the field and you go through that first time and you're harvesting, going away, picking, 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 and you come across a pumpkin and Oh, it's not quite there yet. What do I do? Do I pick it? Do I leave it? Well, we end up typically leaving it today. And then after a couple of days, we've gone through the field and you return and you go back for seconds and you go through all picking out those loose ends that weren't quite ready there. And it is actually worth it. You do get a couple of ton out of it. But when we think of Ruth and where we're coming to in the scriptures, this idea of barley harvest, Israel, It was actually a practice that was illegal. If we turn into Leviticus and chapter 19 very briefly, as they are living under that Mosaic law, it helps us to understand just a a little bit more about what is Ruth actually asking of Naomi. In Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 9, we find the Lord's law concerning this. When you reap the harvest of your lands you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest and you shall not glean your vineyard nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard you shall leave them for the poor and the stranger I am the Lord your God again in Deuteronomy chapter 24 There's a bit of repetition here, but also a bit of expansion. 
as he incorporates different aspects. Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 19. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, that's a bundle, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When we think of gleaning, this is actually God's hearty provision. It's not simply an, uh, made illegal to you know, slap on the wrist farmers and of you know, to be mean towards them. It's God's hearty provision for those poor and vulnerable in the land. This is how they were to get their daily bread. They were to labor for it. Though it be through a beggar's action, as it were, it was still a provision from the Lord in these means. And so when we look at Ruth and think about this, what's she actually asking to do when she goes out to ask, may I glean? Well, as we think of Ruth's character as it reveals, if this is truly a beggar's action, then think of the humility in her heart as she goes to do this. She's not like that unjust servant who has that pride lifting up in his heart and says, I'm too ashamed to beg. Nor does she go to the other side and say, well, since I have need, and then am I able to, unable to provide for myself, well, then I'll go steal. No, rather, she looks for the opportunity by which she might labor, even through these means, that where she might provide provision for herself, even through the Lord's ways. She humbles herself, even to the point of gleaning. But as we also think about what she's asking here, not only is it that aspect of humility of being a beggar's action and having to take the leftovers, the scraps, of the harvest. Do you think this was easy work? Think of Ruth's diligence in this. She's come into this part of Israel, a widow, poor, a stranger, and what does she do? Does she just sort of lay around the house and, you know, idle, busybody, let's go hang out with my friends, take Naomi's credit card? No. What is she doing here? She's looking for gainful employment. She's looking for how she might labor. And even through that labor of that physical, hard, hot, sweaty, dirty labor, as she's bent over like an emu all day long, coming back with a sore back, sore hands, filthy. It's not easy work that she's proposing to do, and yet this is her diligence in, as she goes to move forward towards these things. But also as we think about what she's doing in verse 2, I wonder how this would read if we were to simply cut out some of verse 2. If you'd read with me in verse 2 or verse 1, there was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. And then almost skipping verse 2, so Ruth the Moabites into verse 3, left and went and gleaned in the field. What's missing? I mean, obviously verse 2 has been missing, but then what is it that verse 2 is actually about? <coughs> She's asking permission. This daughter-in-law comes to her mother-in-law and asks for permission. She's aware of that aspect of honoring her mother's opinion. We see her obedience to the Lord not just in being, not being idle, not in uh, not going out to steal. She humbles herself. She looks diligently as to how she might improve her time and how she might improve her circumstances. But also, she knows that fifth commandment that even you children know. The favorite of the parents. What is that? To you honor your father and your mother. She begins to honor her mother and ask for permission, not presuming upon that permission of, oh, hey, mom, I'm just going to go out today. That's it. I'm off. No, but she seeks her wisdom. Is this actually the best thing to be doing? Maybe she might know the field that I should go to. She can provide some directional guidance or help in this matter. She doesn't simply go out presumptuously, but she waits in submission. 
And so what comes from this? Naomi gives her blessing upon her labor. Go, my daughter. And as she leaves, we think of Ruth's initiative in all of this. She's going out. What do you think she's going out with? This expectation of, oh, it's all miserable. I can't do anything. It's never going to work. Or does she go out with an expectation of hope? She's seeking to be obedient to the Lord. She's seeking how she might provide for not only herself, but likely her mother-in-law as well in this situation. Does she go out with that sense of optimism, that brightness? What might the Lord do in this situation? And even as we go on to read the verse, well, what does the Lord actually do in verse 3? Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to that part of the field. We ought not to miss the Lord's providence in these verses, though he might not be mentioned by name, as it were. These things are not simply chance happenings, but the Lord is yet going before her. Even as Ruth has made her plan, the Lord is yet directing her steps. And so too, my friends, what we, when we are to make our plans, we are to commit these things to the Lord. We are to be looking to Him for how we might direct our steps in these ways, how we might improve our situation and not to be idle, but to be as Ruth. But even as she goes out, as we come to think of Boaz, well, what does Boaz uh, do in this situation? What does the narrative go on to explain about Boaz as we think of his generosity? But before we come to that, we want to first just open up, who is this character? It's really the first time that we've been introduced to him in this narrative in chapter 2. He simply comes onto the scene. He's a man of great wealth. He's a relative of Naomi's husband. His name is Boaz. But as we try and fill out some of these details, you know, it's very 2D and flat. Okay, there's this person and he's somehow related to these people. How do we get some depth into this? Well, if you turn in your Bibles to chapter 4, we start to see this open up. In the genealogy, genealogy of all places, Ruth chapter 4 and verses 18 and following. It might seem like a long list of names, but I think that as we look at these, uh, some of these names, two in particular, and fill them out from other parts of Scripture, it helps give us a fuller picture of who this man, Boaz, really is. In verse 18, now this is the genealogy of Perez. So simply so that we can understand who is Perez. You know, it's just another name that, oh, okay, what, who's he? If we think of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who it's called Israel, he has his sons, one of them is Judah. Judah's son is Perez. That's who we're talking about here. So the grandson of the patriarch. As we go through his genealogy, through the line of Judah, we see that Boaz is of that line. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez beget Hezron, Hezron, Ram, Ram, Aminadab, Aminadab, Nason, Nason, Salmon, Salmon, Boaz. Now there's a lot of names there, but the three that I want to focus on in particular is Boaz's father and his grandfather. That would be Nason and then Salmon. Nason, his grandfather, Salmon, his father, Boaz, his son. I'm sorry if that's a bit confusing trying to keep these names in your head, but it really does help us to understand who Boaz is. When we think of Nason, we actually find him in the uh, book of Numbers. Numbers. Numbers chapter 1. That's where he's introduced to us. Might be helpful to turn there briefly. This is Boaz's grandfather. I wonder if you think of, you know, who your grandfather was. Maybe he was some great man, some, maybe, you know, he's not as that great in terms of the world's perspective, but he means a lot to you. As we think of who Boaz's grandfather here, well, this is who he is. In Numbers chapter 1, we have that opening scene of Moses and Aaron uh, Moses before the face of the Lord being told to number, to conduct a census of Israel. Not just everyone in Israel, but particularly the military might of Israel, all those men of war. And as these people are being numbered, 
in those opening verses, he says, you're to have one man from these tribes to represent, to be the commander-in-chief, as it were, the military officer over the entire tribe's army. In verses 2 to 4, specifically, take a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel by their families, by their father's houses, according to the number of names, every male individually. From 20 years old and above, all who are able to go to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their armies. And with you there shall be a man from every tribe, each one the head of his father's house. And if we drop down to verse 7, we see that from Judah, that would be Nathan, the son of Aminadab. In verse 16, he explains what their position is a little bit more. These were chosen from the congregation, leaders of their father's tribes, heads of the divisions in Israel. This is Boaz's grandfather. Not simply a local political official. He is the military commander of the entire army of Judah. How many is that? In verse 27, we get that number as they go through a number of these people. Those who were numbered of the tribe of Judah were 74,600. Boaz's grandfather is the military commander in this tribe of Israel, and he is responsible for the lives of almost 75,000 men. I wonder if when you think of your grandfather, you think of, okay, he's you know, one of the top guys in Australia's military. When we're introduced to this man in Ruth chapter 2, it says that he is a man of great wealth. Do you think that this might have something to do with it? (laughs) He's clearly an established political leader in Israel. It's not simply a case of him being a passing person at this point. I think that this helps us fill out some of those uh, aspects of his lineage. His childhood, when he thinks of Not only is this man the head of Israel's armies, in that uh, Judah's armies in that aspect, but also when you think of who was he alive with? When was this? This is the time of Moses and Aaron. He's a contemporary with these people, seeing, being an eyewitness to the miracles of God in that situation. His son, Salmon, Boaz's dad, When we think of him, what was his situation as he grows up in this? Likely a contemporary with Joshua and the conquering of the land of Israel. We see his name actually pop up in Matthew and it says that little bit of detail that we don't find from the Old Testament genealogies that Salmon actually begot Boaz by Rahab. Now, we can't be dogmatic that it's that same Rahab from Joshua's campaigns but I see no reason to discount it in the light that God has given me when we think of that situation who is this Boaz that comes onto the scene what a stark contrast is he to Elimelech you know Elimelech takes his family off into this far country and dies effectively as an away from the Lord's people leading his family away and yet here is this man no doubt would have come through the same famine and yet was faithful to the Lord. That's something of Boaz's introduction, but then in terms of what do we see him as he starts to unfold in this story, in verse 4 we continue. Now behold, I love that word, it's simply one of those aspects of the author saying, look at this, specifically take note of this. How does Boaz come into his workplace? Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. I think that's one of those moments where a tear would come to your eye if your boss came into the workplace and said, The Lord be with you, as his g'day. (laughs) I would be able to say, The Lord bless you to him back. As he goes on, He's come by this local field. 
Maybe he's simply doing the rounds, and what does he go on to say? Then Boaz said to his servant, who is in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? So he's out there, it's barley harvest, the ha- reapers are going at it, the people are gathering sheaves behind him, and the gleaners are coming up behind even them. And yet, as he surveys the field, he's able to pick out, that's a new one. I wonder what made her stand out. Maybe it was that she was simply a foreigner. Maybe it was that she was actually, you know, one of those real hard workers. You go out and you see, you know, even in an office environment or if you're actually out in a paddock, you can see that difference. You know, you see that person who's just, oh, better look busy. Or that other person who's actively looking for work, going hard at it. And maybe that's what catches her attention. And so he inquires after her. So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, it is the young Moabite woman who came back from Naomi, with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Then Boaz says to Ruth, and so he calls her to himself and begins to have this exchange with her and pours out such provision for her. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Pause and you think and you look at what he's actually giving to this young woman, this effective stranger to him. We might well with Ruth fall down and ask that same question. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground and said to him, why? Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And here is Boaz's answer. It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know. Boaz wasn't a man who was ignorant of his local news. He was up to date. He had been reading the local papers, seeing the different news stories, maybe on Facebook, going through those feeds as it were, and getting a balanced understanding of local events. These things weren't reported by the reaper. The reaper is simply saying, oh, yeah, yeah, she came and stopped by this morning. But he knows. And he begins to open his heart in compassion towards this woman. What does he actually provide for her as we think more slowly in verses 8 and 9, walking through these verses now? He says to her, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Think of Ruth's situation as a foreigner in the land of Israel. I wonder if you've been in that situation where, you know, you come into that new club or that new workplace, that new uh, church perhaps, and you sort of look around and you're like, ah, I don't really know who to talk to. Who do I stick with? Maybe even when you're changing countries. For Ruth, that's a very real situation. And yet here, Boaz opens that door wide and says, here are companions. Stay close by my young women. Going on, he says, let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? Here he gives that promise of that protection Think of Ruth's situation here. She's leaving in the wee hours in the morning, a sole woman by herself without a husband. She's going out to into this field, working all day in the company of laborers, hardworking men and women, and then coming back in the evening by herself in that sense of isolation and exposure. It's easy to see how she might be abused, how she might come under attack, how she might find herself in those difficult situations. And yet, what does Boaz do for her in this, but even 
reassure her, have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? You may say here, there is safety, there is protection. I will care for you. This is what he gives to Ruth, but also in that end part of verse 9, and when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. It seems like such a small token. But think about her laboring in the sun, that humidity rising up, sweating throughout the day. Maybe she's brought a, some sort of water vessel with her to drink from, but in those days, it's not like you had a big ice block sitting and they're keeping it cold the whole day. It's as the day is warming up and it's getting soupy and the water starts to get soupy and you find no refreshment in it. And yet, what does Boaz offer to him? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. It seems like such a small thing, this aspect of water, and yet how refreshing it must have been. For her to have done the same, she would have had to quit the field, lose the product. And yet here is this promise, they will yet bring water to you. You can drink from what they are providing. Even as it goes on to say in verse uh, 14, 13 and 14, they continue with that exchange. In verse 14, now Boaz said to her at mealtime, come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched or cooked grain to her. And she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. He even provides for her even those aspects of food and water. But then, of course, there's the most obvious one, which we've been skipping over in verses 8 and 9, those aspects of do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. The most obvious provision that Boaz gives to her is that aspect of security, stability. She goes out looking for work, not knowing, am I going to be here one day and there another? If I go there and tomorrow, will I actually find a field that will keep me? And yet Boaz opens his heart wide and provides for her stable employment, as it were. Not paid in terms of money, but paid in terms of she will be satisfied, she will find what she needs. He follows through in his word in verse 15, even in that aspect, after they have that meal together, she goes to rise up and to continue working and Boaz follows through with these things, so they're not just empty words, he commands his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Also let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. He follows through. Not just in letting her glean, but even in abundance. Leave some for her. Let some fall on purpose. You can imagine in some of these fields, you know, you've got these people trying to come up amongst the people who are picking the bundles up and trying to tie them off and load them onto the donkeys or carts. You can think of, you know, these beggars, as it were, these gleaners coming up, even in the midst of them, trying to grab bits and pieces, and the person getting frustrated who's actually paid to do that and saying, get out of here, what are you doing? But that's not what happens here. Boaz specifically commands them, saying, no, don't be like that. Let them fall for her. She has my permission. She has my blessing in this aspect. And that comes through most clearly in that central verse in verse 12. As Boaz gives his blessing upon her work, the Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. We think of that aspect of gleaning how it's God's hearty provision for the poor, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow among you, and yet was not Ruth all these things? And how does the Lord 
even provide for her through Boaz. Boaz opening wide his heart to meet the needs of this foreigner, Ruth. And it's not simply a case of, oh, it's nothing, it was easy, he had abundance. This wasn't free. This cost Boaz. It cost him that product, it cost him those aspects of having to get his young men to cater for another person. It cost him in these different ways. And yet how gracious has the Lord been to Ruth in this situation? Boaz was one of those people who understood those aspects of the Proverbs. There is a man who waters and yet himself is watered. There is a man who gives and has abundance and there is another who withholds and comes to poverty. He knew the aspect of what he had was not his but belonged to the Lord and was liberal in what he was gifting to those he could provide for. And so as we move through this and think of of Baez's generosity, let us now come to look at Naomi's response to such a harvest. As we continue through the narrative in verse 17. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. When we think of that barley, what it actually is, uh, it's kind of actually like a grain or a small seed if you want to think of it that way and a big bushel head that would have to get beaten out and have these seeds fall and then collected up. And so not only has Ruth been going hard at it all day, except for two small breaks that we read about, she then has to take all of this product, beat it out with a staff, collect all of that grain, put it into a vessel, carry that back to Bethlehem, back to the townhouse. And when we think of 40 litres, you know, an ephah, it's actually about 40 litres. So think of maybe one of those, uh, you know, reject shop containers, plastic containers, and think of that full of seeds as it were, like these tiny little barley seeds. How much did she actually harvest? How long was she beating that out before she was able to collect that all and then bring it back? It seems like a small detail yet how it shows the Lord's faithfulness and his graciousness towards her and giving her these things. And so she labors into the evening and comes back to her mother-in-law in in verse 18. Then she took it up and went into the city and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. There's this aspect of, you know, she comes in and look, mom, look what the Lord has blessed us with. And as though that wasn't enough, we read in the second half of that verse, by the way, so she brought out what she had Sorry. So she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. You might think that that's sort of like an aspect of, you know, she kept some of that barley back for herself and then gave the excess to Naomi. That's not what it's talking about. Rather, this is a reference back to her meal with Boaz. During that time with Boaz, she had that cooked meal. She's satisfied and she keeps some back. And it's a case of, look, mom, look what I've brought in terms of the barley. But then also, look... There's already cooked food for us for this evening. When you think of the amount, the fact that she's coming back with cooked food, she's been out all day, well into the evening. She comes back late at night and, oh, maybe, where's Ruth? You know, I'm getting a bit worried about her. And then she comes back with this haul and it's a case of, where have you gleaned today? In verse 19. Where have you gleaned today and where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. even as it were a passing comment 
What is Naomi's response here? It is a one of praise, of prayer, asking for the Lord's blessing upon Boaz, but even in passing, it's a case of worship, as it were, to the Lord. Thankfulness to Him. How has the Lord been kind to them? Even as they look upon the Lord's grace to them, going before them, directing Ruth's steps, leading them to Boaz, and all of this generosity, where do they acknowledge it to come from but from the Lord Himself? My friends, even as we think upon the Lord's goodness towards us, ought not we to give thanks to Him for His grace towards us? Even as we heard last week, that aspect of thanksgiving to be even a theme of our Christian lives, as it were, giving thanks for all things. Those, these, though these people, Naomi and Ruth, were yet still poor, still strange, well, in Ruth's case, still a stranger. They're both still widows, and yet they're still able to give thanks to the Lord. What a contrast this is, even compared to the end of the previous chapter, when we see Naomi having those aspects of, the Lord has brought me home again empty. The Lord has afflicted me and troubled me. Though that cloud had came apart and blocked that view of the Lord, yet it was only a short time before the Lord would yet show his smile once more as she gives thanks to the Lord. It goes on to say, this man is a relation of ours, one of our close relations. And Ruth the Moabite has said, he also said to me, you shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women and that people do not meet you in any other field. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest. And she dwelt with her mother-in-law. This isn't simply a small time, but it is an extended time of the Lord's blessing upon this family. And we think upon this aspect of Ruth's initiative as how she goes out to labor with hope, how the Lord blesses her labors, blesses that expectation, and they give thanks. Are not there things that we can be thankful to the Lord as he shows his grace towards us? For that particularly, that greatest aspect, when we ourselves as poor beggars, in rags as it were, in our sin, are drawn near to the Lord God when he showers his blessing upon us in Christ and drawing us near to him and clothing us and giving us the food of righteousness of his word. That greatest aspect of the Lord Jesus Christ himself giving us those gifts. My friends, is this not such a picture? that we find here of the Lord's grace towards Ruth and Naomi of an even of his grace towards us that he will draw near to us draw us near to him as we think upon these things will we not worship our Lord for his faithfulness His faithfulness that knows no end towards us. Let us pray and come before him now.